Hello, everyone. Happy New Year. Welcome to the Muse Writers Center. Thank you for joining us this evening. We are super excited to celebrate the work of Beth Ost Williams and the release of her new poetry collection from Finishing Line Press, Riding Horses in the Harbor. My name is Luisa A. Igloria. I am also on the faculty of the Muse, as well as in the MFA Creative Writing Program at Old Dominion University, and I'm also the current Poet Laureate of Virginia. Before we start, I want to tell you about the Muse Writers Center. The Muse is one of the largest literary centers in the country. We offer online and in-person creative writing classes in all genres for all levels and ages. Our new winter spring 2021 schedule is online now at the-muse.org. So be sure to check out these classes and workshop schedules. They're all very exciting. And all of them are currently virtual because of the pandemic. Um, I also want to remind everyone that the Muse offers tuition assistance for everyone who might need it, and we don't turn anyone away. Last year, the Muse gave away almost $30,000 in tuition assistance just because we don't want anything getting in the way of someone who wants to learn to write. There are also hundreds of free literary events offered every year, including teacher readings, book launches such as this event tonight, writing clubs, and so much more. This month, please look this month, please look out for a lot of exciting events, including two student readings on the 20th and the 27th. Now, a quick disclaimer before we get started on this reading. All work read by the reader is their original work and is owned by the reader unless otherwise noted. Some of the work here today may be published in print or online, but sometimes readers might share unpublished work. So this live stream today is in no way a publication of these unpublished works. A recording of the live stream will be available on the Muse Facebook page, the YouTube page, and on the website at the-muse.org after this event. Following the reading, there will be a QA, and I hope you participate. Uh, and if you're watching live and have a question that you'd like to ask, you can write it in the Facebook event page or if it's available in the YouTube comment section. Now, it's my great pleasure to welcome and introduce Beth Williams. Beth Ost Williams' poetry has appeared in West Texas Literary Review, Wisconsin Review, Glass Mountain, and the Bookends Review, among others. She was nominated for the 2019 Pushcart Prize in Poetry, received second place in the 2019 Poetry Matters Project, and was a semi-finalist for Poets Billow 2018 Atlantis Award. I know Beth mostly from having worked with her over the years in many poetry workshops here at the Muse. So besides learning of her previous career in retail banking before she returned to school for her master's in library science and then did a stint working at the Kern Library downtown, I've also come to know Beth as a dedicated writer whose eyes and ears are constantly attuned to the possibility that poetry could turn up in even those small spaces easy to overlook. And I'm gonna give the, um, the news away, but just before we started this program, she got an email or a text saying that uh, Rattle, um, the weekly Rattle response on Rattle Online Magazine has selected her poem, I Knew Better Than to Say Happy New Year for their weekly Rattle response feature. So make sure you go look at that tomorrow. And now I'm thrilled to welcome along with you, uh, Beth and the poems in her new chapbook, Riding Horses in the Har Harbor. Here's Beth. Thank you so much, Louisa, that's very kind. Um, thank you to the Muse for um, letting me do this book launch. They've been very important in my writing. Uh, as Louisa mentioned, I started <clears throat> taking classes at the Muse about five years ago, and I give them a lot of credit for helping me on my path. Um, I also wanna thank Kendra McDonald, who was a fantastic teacher and did a little blurb for my chat book. And of course, Finishing Line Press, who published the book. 
I also want to give a shout out to Kay Gerhardt, my dear friend who did the cover artwork for the book. And also thanks to Prince Books, who is um, carrying the book. I'm going to read seven poems from the chapbook. Uh, most of the poems in the book have something to do with the local waterways. I grew up on the Elizabeth River, and I like referring to Elizabeth as a person, um, as a persona, and you'll hear that a lot throughout the poetry. The first poem in the book is called Elizabeth River Rising. It's an extreme high tide and Elizabeth's rough hands slap the back of my yard like she's angry at grass. Wet, her body writhes for the distance of brick, my patio, a place to rest. Opening the back door, I invite wind to wake up the room, this quiet tomb where I catch myself dying. The voice of water is wordless, yet her singing seeps deep into my bones. It sounds like memory, the den of swimming in the dark. Cold, I close the door and pull my mother's hand crocheted blanket to my ears. Nature's hymns, once let into the house, keep humming. Asked the, step, the source of my river, I can't answer, can't name a mountain brook. Water is simply pushed in from the sea until there's no strength to push more. My river is more like a bay, an inlet of waiting. I watch the water rise, the flood like love, mother lifting me from the crib. The next poem I'm going to read was actually the first one that I ever got published, and it was a huge day in my life. I was thrilled. Uh, it's called Drink in the Morning. Oars sip river water, hull swallows hard, sip, swallow, sip, swallow. No breaks on a wooden skull, it glides smoothly by before breakfast, sip, swallow, sip, swallow. Sun rolls out of bed in the southeast morning, spreads her wake-up call. Ducks, geese, sing louder, drown out the fading. Sip, swallow, sip, swallow. The next poem actually started uh, in one of Louise's classes. She asked us to pick out a poem or a text that meant something to us and work off of um, an image or a line and see where that takes us in a poem of our own. And so this started, um, a friend of mine had written a poem that had a line comparing his mother's eyes to stars. And this one's called, These Stars, Now Your Mother's Eyes. The baby wears a porcelain face, stitches on her hands. I put her in a basket by the river and scream before letting go. I call this a haunting, the repeated theme of an unwanted dream, what turns my head at unthinkable things. I waste most days sucking excess pressure from my brain, fear broken bones, heels caught in cracks and never seeing you again. Giving thanks is for those who sleep through the night, those who wake among the living. The sun tries to blind me. Bad news bores a hole through my heart. I blink too long, look behind me, and you're gone. I wish I could tell you the stars are just stars and not your mother singing. So even though a lot of the poetry in the book has to do with the river, uh, my parents seem to be cropping up in it a lot. Um, I started writing poems again. I did, I did a lot of writing when I was in um, high school and college for creative writing. And then I gave it up for a while, but picked it up um, as a way to deal with grief when my father's health was failing. And um, so my mother um, had passed away many years ago. So both my mother and father who had both passed away do appear in a lot of these poems. And uh, in a way it's definitely dedicated to both of them. And this one is called Shelter. Writing about him sticks a pen in my eye, drags the finality of ink through tears. Did he expect me to save him or just serve ice cream? Missing him is suffering the life of a mute, 
unable to tell him I'm sorry, unable to ask for advice. So I wander the edges of the river, knowing if I dare to sail, I'll drown. Catching wind in the jib gives in to grief, the heavy air knocking me all the way over. I feel it coming now, just remembering, and the breeze cuts my stare in two. This is praise for shelter and God's gift of eyelids that close. The, uh, some people might wonder about the title of the book, uh, Riding Horses in the Harbor. I have a friend who is Australian and um, she was telling me about how the um, wind had kicked up in Sydney Harbor. And she said there were horses in the harbor. And what I would refer to as white caps, she calls horses in the harbor. And I was just taken with that. And you'll see it appearing in this poem. This one is called Mother Still Breathes in the Wind. Salt spray blows in my face as I get closer to touching her. With pull and release of the main sheet, I'm careful not to capsize before the meeting is complete. Too close to the shore, my boat slows in calm broth. I'm hidden from wind by the shelter belt of trees. Taunting my failure, the river claps its hands on my hull. I reach for another chance to chase mom's memory. Caught in irons, a wooden stick, my whip, I come about, let blown kisses spill into my cupped jib. I duck to miss the boom swing, quick to catch a spoonful of breath on the following tack. This is the rush of reunion. Strapped in, I ride the back of wild horses and the harbor, the weight of exhale now heavy in my sail. Nor'easter's path. Dad blew by like a spring storm, graying at the edges, grumbling at a distance, fear growing in me as I watched his pain intensify. His last words were screamed and all I did was hide inside, afraid of being struck down from loving someone so much. We are told to take shelter from the rage of nature. We know what the slightest gust of wind can do. I once dropped loose papers and a city breeze and couldn't decide which way to run. Once in a nor'easter, my kayak took off from the pier. I found it, but the water it rode away on never came back. I searched the shore for my dad. He was here just last year, a coxswain shouting orders to thunder and rain. And the last one I'm gonna read uh, sums up really what writing poetry um, can do for me. And um, it's one of the reasons why I, I like to do it. How Shallow the Creek. A poem is my paddle. It takes me where I need to go. When the wind dies, it's the only way to get home. Mother waits for me there, standing on our pier. Her arms reach out to catch the line I throw, to latch me to the land. Her smile is as open as a path through the reeds, her presence steady as a skinny legged crane. I stop the plastic kayak by our old family place, memory pinching from splinters still lodged in my skin. The tide is going out, the creek losing what keeps me afloat. I turn my boat to the mouth, push my paddle underwater, the pen deeper until it hurts, my mother alive only in verse. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. And I think that last poem that you read in the collection is probably my favorite. Although um, I do not know how to swim. I've never been out in a little boat. Uh, nevertheless, there's that enchantment with water also that I can very much relate to. Um, and it, it's time for questions, friends, so please uh, write them down uh, and put them in the chat box on the Facebook page or um, on YouTube. Maybe I'll lead off with a question since we're talking about water and we're talking about the element of, of 
place. It seems to me actually that the poems in your chat book are very much about place, this particular place that we live in. Um, how do you feel about your relationship to this place? And do you think it has been able to capture uh, the changes also? I mean, we talk about how we are coastal, we are facing things like the environmental crisis and how does that affect your uh, thinking about place or your relationship to place when you write poems about it? Well, I definitely think about the climate crisis a lot because seeing the water in Norfolk rise um, constantly with high tides now covering the roads, it, it definitely is something I think about a lot. Um, and I, it's just funny, I, I grew up on the water and my father liked to sail. And so it's always been a part of my life. And so it also makes me think of connections with people who've come before and coming after us and how, you know, even though we may not be here any longer, we're leaving the world behind and we need to take care of it um, so yeah. that people can enjoy and it's not destructive. Do you think that poets have an obligation to talk about these specific crises in the environment and other things in the world? I think if they have the passion to do it, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important to write what strikes you. Um, and mm -hmm. it, most poets seem to be on the same page. Mm -hmm. <laughs> most of the poets I know, we seem to think a lot. But if, if the poet does not feel the urgency, I don't think it would be right to write about it. Right, right. Okay, we have a question from Melissa. And she wants to know, when did you start writing and discovering poetry? I think I was probably six or seven years old when I first started writing. And then as a preteen, I would write when I was angry about something, you know, the drama of coming into puberty and getting older. And um, when I was a senior in high school, I took a creative writing class. And that's when I really started to get more serious about it. And we had a literary journal that I worked on. And then in college, the same thing. I took a lot of writing classes and um, worked on the journal there. When I graduated from college, I actually sent a poem off to Virginia Quarterly Review. And of course was not accepted. And I think that's when I pretty much gave up on it and just put it on a back burner and went on with life. And as I said, it came back you know, full circle with the, the grief made me start writing again. So, and now I do write about things that aren't all sad now. Or maybe it never left, it was just waiting. Um, there are actually a few requests for you to read more poems. Oh. So please do so. I'd be happy to listen to I, them as well. Let's see. one that's good. Okay, how about watch the sky. Low tide and the dragons fly. Black sky to the west watches six women with oars pull against flat water, their old wooden skull gliding backwards. Squinting from streaks of sunset, they don't see the clouds forming. Steady knocking beat of the hull hides each tumble of thunder while lightning makes daylight behind them. Wet wind picks up, glass river breaks into shards. Rowers bow their heads against the cutting rain, not kneeling or praying, just waiting for the storm to pass. Oh, thank you. There are a couple more questions. Um, I'm very excited to hear you respond to them also. So Karen is asking if Finishing Line Press found you or was it the other way around? Well, that's a very good question. I apply, I sent uh, my work, my chapbook off to a number of contests and Finishing Line Press responded and said, I didn't win the contest, but they still wanted to publish my chapbook, which was fantastic. <laughs> and so that's how it was. I am. Um, I became familiar with Finishing Line Press because Noah Wren um, also had a chapbook published with them, as did Kendra McDonald. So I knew of them and thought that it might be a good fit for my work. Yeah. 
Well, I'm going to read um, a question from Sarah, but I'm going to put it together with Annalise question because I think they're related. So Sarah says, hi, Beth, please talk about your process of putting together your chapbook, choosing what poems would go in. It's such a poignant book about memories and grief, presence and absence of your parents. And Annalise chimes in and says it's also beautifully read. She also would like to get a sense of how long it took to put the chat book together. So they're both about your process. So great to hear from you all. I miss you. Um, this chat book actually sort of came together by accident. I realized that I had written a lot about the water and the river. And as I said at the time, a lot of things about my parents. So I initially, I chose about 26 poems that I thought would go together. And then I did the old trick of printing them out and laying them on a table and moving them around and seeing, you know, what order they should go in. Uh, it was, I probably wrote these poems over the course of a year, not knowing that's what I was making. Uh, and then since then I've, I've, I've put other chat books in and written specifically towards a theme, but this one just sort of fell in my life. I realized I had all this material that I could do something with. And uh, what was your revision process could, to kind of finish um, or round out the talk about, like, I guess, craft your process and organizing a manuscript that becomes this chapbook? Uh, for this one, I'm not sure I did too much in the revision um, as far as adding new poems or writing more towards it. I do have a chapbook that I've just put together that I specifically um, wrote an opening poem for it that I thought would lead in to more of an arc that the mm -hmm. chapbook has. Mm -hmm. But I've, I've just, I've recently taken two uh, different revision classes. <laughs> so I'm tearing it all up now and doing different things than I was doing before. Right. I'm going to skip ahead to a question from Janet, but it's not, I'm not going to forget the questions from Buffy and Kelsey. So um, because you've just come from talking about process, Janet wants to know, how do you know when a poem is finished? For me, the poem is finished when I've done all I can do to address it. Um, I, I write a lot. Uh, so there are a lot of poems that I just put down and don't go back to. Um, if it's something I want to go back to, I, I feel like if it's just not quite right, there's more I wanna say and I'm not saying it correctly, then I'll keep going back to it. Um, a lot of them I just put aside and don't try to, get published or anything. It's more like, you know, doing sit-ups or something. It's just sort of a process I go through just to keep writing. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times I, I feel like I'm, I've got something special in it I'm not quite hitting on. So I'll keep going back to it. All right. Well, I think Buffy's and Kelsey's questions are kind of similar. And Kelsey has a disclaimer, I'm her daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so Buffy wants to know, where do you do your best writing? And Kelsey says, where is your favorite place to write? Well, this is gonna be very boring, but I like sitting at the desk in my office. It's a very tiny, dark, cozy office. Um, it doesn't even have a door on it, but it, it, I'm looking at a bookshelf. Uh, there's a window, but I can't see out of it. So I'm really just looking. And I, and <clears throat> in there, when I write in there, I'm writing on the computer. I also have what I call the puzzle room where we do jigsaw puzzles. It's just a little sunroom. Uh, and there's a chair in there that gets a lot of light. And so if I'm writing by hand, I'll write by hand in there. And sometimes I'll start writing by hand and then I'll type when I type it up on the computer, I'll revise it as I'm typing it. All right, thanks. Uh, Allison has a question about whether you have any other collections or themes that you want to publish in the future? Um, I've done some, I don't know if you would quite call it spiritual writing. Uh, I've done some writing sort of questioning how we all relate to religion. And uh, there's some, definitely some poems with Eve and Mary in them. And I've started putting um, a couple of chat books together based on those themes. And then um, I've got a collection I'm working on. It's sort of the same thing with the river and the parents, and but more along the theme of um, seaweed and how memories are like seaweed and they just grab hold of you and you won't let go. 
All right. So um, Jane wants to know, was it difficult to order the poems? Yeah, I think that it was very difficult. I mean, I think getting the first and last ones was probably the easiest part. But then some of it sort of fell into play. Like the one I read about shelter, I didn't realize I'd used shelter, the word shelter in another poem. So once you lay them all out and I mean, it's like doing the jigsaw puzzle. You know, you see how things do fit together. And a lot of people don't even realize they're using the same word over and over. And so I, I saw, I did see where it would go once I started playing with it. And, I, and it wasn't first off. It took several, maybe maybe 10 different arrangements before it fell into place. All right. So um, Anne wants to know, is there a poet or writer who especially inspires you? Well, um, definitely Louisa Igloria Kink. <laughs> I didn't pay her to say that. But I'll tell you, um, when I started taking classes at the Muse, I was not reading poetry at all. I, you know, we all studied the old masters, but I was not reading contemporary poetry at all. Um, since then, I've been lucky enough to be in classes with um, Jericho Brown, Mary Shibbest, Vivi Francis, there's poets that are contemporary and I really adore. Um, this year, when we weren't able to, I wasn't able to go to AWP, a lot of people didn't go to the conferences back in March, I decided I would start buying new chapbooks and full-length manuscripts that were coming out. So I've, <clears throat> um, Natalie Diaz, I loved reading her work. Um, Leela Chatty's Deluge was fantastic. Um, Michael Torres, my, many people may not know him. He uh, actually was at Bread Loaf with us and just has an amazing book called An Incomplete List of Names. So I encourage everybody, just go out and pick up a book of poetry, whether you know who it is or not, and just read through it. And you will, you'll find some poems that you like. You'll find some lines that you want to underline. And, you know, then hopefully you'll keep going from there and buy more. Yeah, I agree. And I think that buying a book is a great way to support poets everywhere. So thanks for that shout out for all poets. Um, um, Melissa says the cover is gorgeous as well as the font. Can you share how these came together for you? Well, I didn't have anything to do with the font. And the funny thing is a friend of mine today said she loves the feel of the book, the way that <laughs> the texture is. I said, well, I didn't have anything to do with that either. But the artwork is um, Kay Gerhardt. And here's actually the painting behind me. She's a local uh, Norfolk painter and a dear friend. And uh, they, you know, when the contract was coming together with the book, they said, you can pick out the artwork for it. And I've when I heard artwork, I immediately thought of Kay. And I know she likes to do landscapes, um, see the sea and the river. And I asked her if she'd be interested and um, luckily she was. So I'm very honored to have her as a collaborator on this. Mm -hmm. Debbie has a fun little question. She wants to know if you carry a little notebook with you or if there are a million little scraps of paper in your purse. I should carry a notebook with me, but since I don't go anywhere anymore, I'm not carrying a notebook. But um, the very first class I took at the Muse was with Sarah Pringle, and she said she keeps a jar of words. And I followed her advice, and I do have scraps of paper that I keep in a big jar beside my computer. And sometimes I'll just go through it to see if there's a line that will work or a word that I want to explore more. But um, usually, Usually I take time when I'm off, when I'm out somewhere, I'm not, I, I have things in my brain. I might even, you know, text myself when I'm thinking that I haven't been writing it down when I'm out. All right. Well, from, I think this is Sig Carlo. Um, some poets talk about the cathartic experience of writing. How do you feel about exposing your inner thoughts to the, maybe the judgment of others? Good question, Carla. Um, the best thing about writing a poem is writing a poem. So for me, the process is just wonderful. And there is definitely some censorship that I would not share some of the poems that I've written um, for publication necessarily. Um, but yet there are, there are poems, and I was talking to Louisa earlier, there are poems that are, have been published of mine that are not racy, but they push the button. And 
they're not necessarily, not everything, you know, is autobiographical. There's truth in it, but it's not necessarily the truth that I have experienced <clears throat> firsthand. Um, so even though it might sound like I'm bearing my soul and telling you this secret that no one should hear, it may not really be my secret. It's just something about it that I would like to share. All right. And I think uh, before we end, if, if you're okay with reading one more poem, because there's such a huge outcry from our audience, they would love to hear even just one more poem. Please select one and read more. <clears throat> Mother's death is hard to swallow. I wish I had your hand back in mine that holding on to it would keep you alive, like saving a man overboard from drowning. But our boat heeled too far to starboard. You slipped into the dirty water, and all I did was watch you fade beneath the surface. Alone, I tightened my grip on the rocking gunwale and counted your air bubbles as if nine would be a good number. Nine months I swam with you, nine lives are make-believe, nine pieces of candy fill my mouth. Minutes are chocolate, chocolate-covered raisins, tiny bits of pleasure I eat up way too quickly, and then they are gone. If I could spit up yesterday, I'd be blowing soap bubbles in the bath, you washing me gently, one hand on my back. Thank you so much, Beth. And before we close tonight, uh, thank you everyone who has been here and listened and been so supportive. Beth, would you hold up your book so people know what to look for and pick up at the bookstore? You say Prince Books carries it and other places. So please support our local writers, support Beth's book. It's a beautiful chapbook. I know I have seen this, these poems firsthand. And uh, again, congratulations and uh, just looking forward to more good stuff from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luz.